Carolina. So they'll be coming home tomorrow. Uh, a couple other things. Wednesday night Bible study is back. And so we had over 20 adults in the sanctuary on Wednesday night. That, If you missed it and you want to pick back up with us, we were in Matthew um, 8. And it's recorded on our Facebook channel. You can check it out. And so I hope that you will check that out and, um, and enjoy that. Let's see. Also... Um, we encourage you to sign up over here for the uh, prayer time, to lead the prayer time one Sunday. And in addition to that, we have some opportunities in the kids' ministry that you can help us out with. Anybody have any other announcements that need to be made this morning? Anything else going on? All right. Uh, let's see now. Uh, praises. Anybody have anything good happen to them this week? Anybody have anything good? Yes, Dagny. Went to the baseball game, went to Muddy the Mudcat, and your sister told me they had a no fishing sign because they didn't want anybody to catch Muddy, right? So uh, good stuff, good stuff. Today is my eldest, I think he's on the ramp back there to make his interest, it's his 21st birthday, good gracious, so Joey turns 20 up. There he is, there he is. Uh, so that's good. Also another praise, we were praying for a woman named Danielle Brindle and her daughter, I mean, excuse me, and her baby that was born, and she had COVID. Well, she's now come home, as have has the baby. So we're very thankful about that. Also, just to praise, I, I've asked God for opportunities, and you got to be careful what you're asking for sometime because August, I was bored to death. We were basically under three weeks quarantine before we knew we had COVID, and then after we had COVID, two weeks of quarantine. Then, you know, we had the Youth Sunday last week and wasn't having Bible studies and all that, but this will be the tenth time that I have either preached or taught in the last six days because I preached six times at Wake Christian Revival and then I filled in for a Bible teacher there who has COVID and then we started back Wednesday night. And the Lord has allowed me to keep my voice, so <laughs> at least so far. Whether that's good or bad, I'll let you be the judge after the sermon today. How about that? But at any rate, I'm excited about that and glad to be back and doing things and welcome everybody that is watching online. We know we got a lot of people vacationing that are checking us out. Anybody else have anything he praises us this morning? Anybody? All right, just stand up and say hello to your neighbor in the way that you feel comfortable, and we will uh, get to going here. Quiet, that must mean y'all are just waiting to sing. So I can't wait to hear how good you are at singing. All right, we're going to do a couple songs that are um, songs that should be decently familiar to you. They're repetitive enough if they're not. So hopefully, um, let's worship the Lord this morning. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. Even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life I won't turn back, I know you are near And I will fear no evil For my God is with me And if my God is with me Whom then shall I fear? Whom then
Thank you so much for this day. We know there's a lot going on in our world and in our individual lives, and it's a crazy time, and we just pray that your presence would be with us and among us, that your name would be glorified today, and oh, we just pray for safe travel for all those that are traveling this weekend, and we thank you that we can gather here in freedom and in truth and in your spirit, and uh, I just thank you for everything you've done. In your name we pray. Amen. Kids, you can be dismissed. just take that amount of chairs over and rack the white chairs on a rack back there the youth can have almost a full half court to do their recreation and stuff on on Wednesday night as well so instead of having teams that would be set up and tear down teams every week um, part of the deal with the youth is you can keep the nine square up but y'all got to set the chairs back up on Wednesday night after your 
uh, youth meeting. So it worked out good. So in other words, anybody that's here on any given Sunday that wants to help us, we'll have a system where we've got a couple of chair racks where we can stack the chairs, move the red ones over here, and then we'll have a rack for the white ones. We'll get it done like in five minutes after church starting next week. And then uh, the youth will put them back, and that'll be a great chance for them to have more opportunities and recreation. Let's see. Also, we're going to, uh, people have been asking about larger uh, Life is Short, Live It Well bands. We got some more. They'll be, they're, they're the larger size, so I'm going to be putting them out this week. We'll have more of those, and I'll put out some more of the smaller ones as well. So that was all I was going to tell you about other than Wednesday nights are back in service, so hopefully you can come and uh, be a part of that. I'm going to ask Brother Jim to come up and lead the prayer time. Good morning. Uh, ask that all of y'all remember all these prayer requests. There's a bunch of them. Uh, prayer is powerful, and when church prays, things happen, so just keep that in mind. Uh, let's remember the youth on their rafting trip. Uh, we want to have uh, pray for safe travel for all the Labor Day, Labor Day travelers. Uh, Linda Chandler, which is a friend of the Swindle family, is battling COVID. A lot of people with COVID on this list. Uh, David Stansel, which is uh, Tommy Stansel's son, um, has COVID, uh, has had it for two weeks, and it's not getting better. Uh, Braden Ball, which is uh, Sherry Stansel's nephew, uh, is in ICU at Rex on a ventilator with COVID, uh, pneumonia, and he's got internal bleeding as well. Uh, Clark Williams, which is a friend of uh, Donald Bryson, uh, has been in ICU in Georgia with COVID. Uh, he's hopefully moving into a uh, regular room today, but he's still on oxygen. Um, Noah Addicts, which is uh, Rob Walker's stepson's dad, uh, passed away yesterday from COVID. Let's remember them in prayer. Uh, my wife uh, is suffering uh, with a bunch of nerve pain. Uh, she's been in bed pretty much all week, so she's, uh, she's having a tough time right now. Please remember her. Uh, for those of you that know uh, Joe S. Strickland, her husband, uh, Ashley, passed away yesterday with COVID. Uh, let's remember her. Um, she runs a ministry in Lillington called Crossing All Borders. It's reached people all over the world, and uh, just pray for her for strength. Uh, my brother Jason Simpkins, he has, uh, he has COVID. He's not doing well. Um, and then also want to remember Manny Lee. Um, he needs a heart transplant, and he is the son of uh, Pastor Gary Lee um, at Rooted Church in Raleigh. So let's remember him. And then lastly, um, I think this is Jonathan Miller. Uh, brother of uh, Tracy uh, McClure, I think it says. Um, he has COVID, so let's, uh, let's remember him as well. But uh, if you would, join me in prayer. Lord, thank you for this time together, Lord. I, I, several prayer requests today, Lord. A lot of people with COVID, Lord, I just pray that, uh, that they will all be healed. Uh, please uh, watch over the youth on their rafting trip, Lord, and just everybody that's traveling today, just pray that uh, you'll give them travel and mercies. Uh, let's remember the, I want to remember the families of uh, Linda Chandler, uh, David Stansel, uh, Braden Ball, uh, Clark Williams. Um, you know, with, with COVID, Lord, we pray that uh, they will be healed and they'll get to come back and, and get back to doing the things that they want to do. We pray for uh, Noah Addicts, uh, who's, uh, whose father passed away with COVID. Lord, I pray for my wife. I pray that uh, you will relieve her pain. Also, uh, Joette Strickland and the loss of her husband, Lord, we pray that you will lift her up. Uh, also, pray for my brother, Jason, uh, who has COVID as well. Pray that he will, he will be healed. And then, Lord, uh, Manny Lee, pray that, uh, that uh, you will help him find a heart and uh, just make everything work out to where, to where he will be able to, uh, to have, a, have a good, long life, Lord. And then lastly, uh, we just want to remember uh, Jonathan Miller who has COVID, pray that, uh, that he will be healed as well, Lord. Again, Lord, thank you uh, for letting us be here. Pray that you will speak through Pastor Chris today, Lord, and let us hear the words that you want us to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and join me in singing Great is Thy Faithfulness.
I can't imagine being tall and not having to move this thing.
Good morning. Today we are reading the words of Moses from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 7, verse 9. Know, therefore, that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commands. Does anybody know what famous thing in history, a tragic thing, happened on April the 15th, 1912? Anybody know what happened that night, that day? What? The Titanic sank that night. The unsinkable ship uh, hit an iceberg and sank, and 1,517 people perished. You know, people have been fascinated by that story that's over 100 years ago. Many great movies and books have been written about it, particularly the 1958 uh, movie, A Night to Remember, and then, of course, the 1997 blockbuster simply called Titanic. My late father was very interested in history and in the Titanic, and I could remember with excitement as we watched back in 1985, 1986, when Robert Ballard and his team discovered the wreckage of the Titanic. Some of the most compelling and memorable scenes from those movies and from the event itself, I'm sure, tragically so, was when the people went into the frigid water, those who had not boarded a lifeboat, and in those final minutes, and tried to cling to anything and everything that they could to keep them from perishing. However, there was nothing that could really save them at that moment. Many lessons were learned from that tragic accident, and you know, most of the time when we have tragedies, lawmakers rush to make new laws and new rules. Uh, That's not always bad. A lot of times it is now especially, but some laws that were put in after that were pretty good, especially when the law that was instituted about you need to have enough lifeboats for everybody on board your vessel. So we're continuing in our series, A Matter of Life and Death. We took a pause last week when we had Youth Sunday, and so we're going to have three more weeks of this. It was designed to be a two-month series, but with me being out for three weeks, um, it kind of, everything got condensed a little bit. And so today we're going to look at a fascinating story in the book of Acts that deals also with a shipwreck. This one was just as dire, but had a little bit or a lot better ending than the Titanic did. Now, we'll learn some lessons from the events that happened to the Apostle Paul on this shipwreck, which was certainly a life-or-death situation for him. But we can also get some lessons for our own lives for when things don't go as we hoped. You know, despite what this world throws at us, we as believers have an anchor that we can hold on to in desperate times when we start to sink. And so I want to say today, when your ship goes down, hang on to God. You know, Apostle Paul dealt with a lot of hardships in his life. In uh, 2 Corinthians 11, he detailed some of the sufferings because some people were claiming that he maybe wasn't doing this for the right reasons, and he listed off all the things that he'd endured in the name of the gospel. And one of the things that he said that was really stark there in 2 Corinthians 11 is that he was shipwrecked three times. I mean, this is not a guy that you want to go out to the Gulf Stream fishing with, right? This is not a guy. When you see him getting on board that cruise, you know, at Royal Caribbean, you you don't care if you lose your money. You just don't go, you know, with him. So uh, in our text today, Paul had been arrested for preaching. You know, in our society now, there's a lot of divide amongst, you know, do we follow what Paul said in Romans 13 about obeying the government or do we you do this thing I think that when it comes to the gospel if the government tries to keep us from spreading the gospel or preaching the gospel that's when it's okay not to obey in fact Paul who wrote those words was arrested for proclaiming the gospel against the government's wishes thankfully it's not that point in our country where we're prohibited from doing that but there are many governments and many countries all around the world where it is prohibited to proclaim the name of Christ, and even being a Christian can get you killed. So Paul had been arrested. He had been to all these different places in the Roman Empire, and he would start churches. 
And he would also encourage people and denounce the false gods and worship the one true God. So if people weren't upset with him enough about the gospel message, they were upset about what he was preaching and how it was affecting others and even their business. In Ephesus, there's a very famous story in the book of Acts where there was a silversmith named Demetrius. And in Athens, they had the temple to the Greek goddess Artemis. Most people believe it was like a meteorite that came because they said it literally fell from heaven, etc. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Well, Paul was preaching that God does not live in temples made by human hands, that God's not limited to that. So what was happening is, as people were being converted, they were also stopping to worship this false goddess, and so the people like Demetrius, they were building these little, it's kind of like if you go see the Statue of Liberty, you get a snow globe, or like we did, we got an ornament for our Christmas tree, you know, and uh, what was happening is people were stopping to buy these products that he and his fellow artisans were making, and so Paul got a lot of people, I mean, there was a riot, they almost killed him, and so a lot of people were after Paul for many different uh, reasons, and he eventually was arrested and held in prison for years. And in prison, instead of feeling sorry for himself, he witnessed to the people there, gained their trust, as we'll see here in our story today, and also wrote letters back to the churches that he had started. And many of those letters have survived, and we have them as part of our New Testament. Paul's desire, his main desire, and the reason that he could have gotten out of prison probably, instead he appealed to Caesar as a Roman citizen, he felt like he wanted to take the gospel message to encourage the church at Rome. Out of all the letters that Paul wrote, the only one that he was writing to a church that he did not start was the, the letter Romans. He was saying how he hoped to be able to get there and visit. We don't have that in the book of Acts as it stops after he's uh, when he's still under house under prison but we believe that he did finally go to Rome and that he was able to preach there but his goal was to be able to proclaim the gospel to the most powerful human on earth at that time who would have been Caesar himself okay so in this section here we Paul is being transferred as a prisoner and they're on their way to Rome. And there's going to be the we passages here where it starts in the book of Acts. It indicates the author, who was Luke, who also wrote the Gospel of Luke, that Luke was with him. In fact, many people believe that Luke's Gospel and then the book of Acts was actually a defense to be presented in Rome to explain the Christian message to the Roman government and whatever, to explain what Paul was doing as a way to witness to them as well. Regardless, we're going to pick up here in chapter 27, and we're going to have a lot of scripture today because this reads more like a narrative. I want you to notice as I go through this how specific Luke is. One of the greatest things about the Bible and one of the reasons that we know the Bible is true because it doesn't read like a fairy tale. It doesn't say once upon a time or in a galaxy far, far away. They're very specific about who was with them, where they were at, what they were doing at certain times, who was the leader at this certain time in this certain place, and all that stuff has been historically accurate. So in other words, it would make it a whole lot more difficult for the story of Christ and of these stories of Paul and what happened here to be made up and to be fanciful because everything else was in this context that can be checked out. And so people could have fact-checked them uh, when this happened. So let's read the first 12 verses first. It says, When it was decided that we, because Luke, even though he wasn't a prisoner, was allowed to travel to help care for Paul's needs, we would sail for Italy... Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius. Isn't that amazing? He even got the name of the centurion. Who belonged to the imperial regiment. We boarded a ship from Adramidium about to sail for ports along the coast of the province of Asia. And we put out to sea. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. The next day we landed in Sidon. And Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends so they might provide for his needs. Let me pause for a minute here. Isn't that amazing? Here's Julius, a Roman, a Roman officer who trusts Paul, this prisoner, so much that when they go into these towns, Paul had already been to these towns during his missionary journeys that lasted years and years, and he preached. And so Paul had friends, so he has enough trust in him that he lets him go to his friend's house 
and get his needs taken care of as they gave him stuff and they housed him, sheltered him and fed him, knowing that Paul was going to come back because Paul wasn't a flight risk. Paul wanted, he believed it was God's will for him to be a prisoner right then and to go to Rome and to testify before Caesar. I mean, how many times when things happen to us that are not good, do, do we have that kind of perspective? That this is, God, even though I don't want to be a prisoner, obviously this is God's will for my life because this is going to result from it. It's an amazing perspective he has there. Also, if a, if a, we'll see later in this story, if a prisoner were to escape, that Roman soldier would, would get the death sentence. Essentially, they would get their punishment. And so this was a lot of trust that he had in Paul to allow him to do this. Verse 4, From there we put out to sea again and passed the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. When we had sailed across the open sea off the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us on board. We made slow headway for many days and had difficulty arriving off Snidus. When the wind did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the Lee of Crete opposite Salmon. We moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fair Havens near the town of Lycia. Much time had been lost and sailing had already become dangerous because it was now after the fast. So Paul warned them, men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring about great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbor in Crete facing the southwest and the northwest. Well, obviously, the guy had a lot of respect for Paul. We don't know if the guy was a Christian, but he understood Paul, but so much so that a prisoner could give advice on what they should do. But he probably did what most of us would do. He listened to the pilot and the owner of the ship. Well, the owner of the ship had a lot invested because he had cargo on there that he was getting paid to deliver. They just boarded the ship as prisoners to make a little extra money out while they were already going in a certain direction. So he needed to get the stuff there by a certain time so that he could get paid. Look what happens next, verse 13. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they thought they had obtained what they wanted, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Calda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. When the men had hoisted it aboard, they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. Fearing they would run aground on the sandbars of Syrtis, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. Now think about this for a second. I mean, this, this had to have been terrifying. First of all, there was no lights on this boat, okay, much less the uh, buffet, all right, on the crew. There's no lights on this boat, and instead of harboring for the winter, they sailed, and they didn't have the weather forecasting abilities that we even have, as meager as our weather forecasting abilities are, right? But they had no way of knowing that a major storm was coming, or if it was brewing or not, and normally shipping did not occur from September through mid-November. Because again, they had no way of knowing what the storms were going to be like. And they, they knew that those were the points where the worst storms would be. And so what happens here is they get driven along. They can no longer sail the way they want to. All they can do is be driven along by the current. They're dr putting the anchors out. The anchors are dragging to slow them down. And then it says they, verse 17, pass ropes under the ship to hold it together. This is called undergirding. It was only done in massively dangerous situations. They would literally put ropes from the front to the back of the ship and secure the ropes together to try to keep this little wooden ship from breaking apart. Now, how would you like to be on a wooden ship out in the middle of a hurricane? In the middle, and this is not the Sea of Galilee, also the Lake of Galilee. This is the big, this is the sea. Okay, that wide open sea. They didn't have the, the maps and the GPS or even the electricity or the lights or anything. I mean, this was a very, very si serious situation that they found themselves in. And they were worried that they were going to hit a sandbar or something because they could see land, but they couldn't make way for the land because the wind and the waves were pushing them the other way. It gets worse. Verse 7, verse 18. 
Verse 17, when the men had hoisted it aboard, they passed their ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. Fearing they'd run aground on the sandbars of Sirtis, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor star to, stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. So look how dire it is. Not only are they holding the ship together with ropes, okay, but in an effort to lighten the ship so that they didn't crash into some kind of sandbar, which is eventually what happened, spoiler alert, okay, but so that they wouldn't do that. They took all of the cargo, all of the things that they were getting paid to haul, and threw it all overboard just to lighten the ship. When a couple more days went by and nothing had gotten any better, they took the tackle, the things that they needed for the ship, and threw that overboard. I mean, you had to think the prisoners were going to think, are we next? You know, we're 200 pounds each, are they going to start throwing us over? But it says they threw it over, and Luke emphasizes, with their own hands. Didn't even get the prisoners or any slaves to do it. They were so desperate, the people running the ship actually threw this over it was dark and the storm was not letting up imagine being on a cruise ship and you're in this huge storm and the boat is rocking and you kind of go out there just for a minute and you see them throwing all the deck chairs over you see them throwing all the other equipment and stuff over just to lighten the ship i mean that is you know this was a very very serious thing look at verse 21 after the men had gone a long time without food paul stood up before them and said men he says, I told you so. For You should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. The loss and the damage of the ship and the loss of the cargo and the tackle. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. So Paul got some, he said, okay, I got something to tell you. Y'all should have listened to me. And we just saved yourself from all this mess and all this expense that you said. But I got some good news and some bad news. What do you want first? Well, give us the good news first. Okay, we're all going to survive. I've been promised an angel of the Lord, we're all going to survive. Well, okay, great. What's the bad news? This ship is going to be destroyed. Wow. Uh, can, can we, you know, maybe, maybe ask your God again or whatever. That, doesn't, that, doesn't, that sounds kind of pretty strong now. So Paul says, verse 22, But now I urge you to keep up your courage, because not one of us will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God whose I am and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. So God sends an angel again to tell him, You are going to get the witness to Caesar. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you all the lives of those who sail with you. That's how he could tell them they were going to be okay. So keep up your courage, men. For I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, here's some more bad news. We must run aground on some island. So we're not going to make it to port. We're going to have to run this thing aground on some island. Pretty tough there. Paul found, though, even in the midst of this raging storm, that he was not alone. God sent this angel to remind him that God's presence was with him. And Paul said, I have faith that this is going to happen. You know, God makes the same promise to us as well. We are living in unprecedented, crazy times. If the Lord doesn't come back and, you know, and I live another 20 years or whatever, I'll be telling my grandchildren, uh, Lord willing, about this time that we've gone through in these last two years. I mean, this is crazy times we're living through. P so many people are sick. So many people are afraid. So many people are depressed. People are turning to, to drugs and, and just all the other stuff that's going on. But God has promised us that he will not leave us. In ver Hebrews 13 says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Matthew 28, 20, at the end of the Great Commission, after he says, go once, and he says, grow twice, he says, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Psalm 23, 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, because why? Thou art with me, you are with me. And God always keeps his promises. The Bible is filled with promises. There are 7,947 promises. No, I didn't count them all. But 7,947 promises in the Bible from God to man. Uh, Psalms like Psalm 37, practically every verse is a promise. 
And so even though a violent storm had interrupted his plans, God knew that, uh, excuse me, Paul knew that God still had a plan for his life. Because God has told us where we're going, but he hasn't showed us or told us exactly how we'll get there. I mean, don't you just want that sometime? Don't you just want to know, God, why, why don't you just give me this map showing me exactly where my life is going to go? Well, the problem is if he did that, we would probably try to go a different way, Right? He's promised us a destination. He's promised us an end game as Christians to, be, to go to heaven and where there is no suffering, there is no evil, there is no loss, there is no sicknesses like we have here. But he hasn't told us how it will get there. We talked about Wednesday night after the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gave this illustration of the two foundations. And you, I, mean, I used to sing this song as a child, and you probably know, well, I'm not going to sing the song, but you know, there's, there's uh, about the two foundations, the one that built it on the rock and the one that built it on the sand. So Jesus was basically saying to them, what are you going to do with what I've just given you? All this on the Sermon on the Mount that I've given you, what are you going to do with it? And he says, the rains came to both houses. You see, that's, that's a big problem in our world, is we have churches that are growing like crazy and are so popular because they're telling people, if you will just do this or do that or give this or whatever, then you will be healthy, wealthy, and wise, and life will be great. And those, they pack them in those churches. The sad thing is the back door is almost as big. They're just recycling the people because people get disenfranchised because when the rains come, and Jesus said the rain would come to both houses, the one built on the rock and the one built on the stand, sand, when the rains come, people say, wait a minute, this is not what I signed up for. What is going on? That doesn't mean that preaching in church should be depressing, but it does mean that we should be honest. I mean, I love you too much to lie to you. Okay, There's going to be struggles in this life, and that's part of our struggle we grow, growing in our faith. And so all of these promises in there, but God has given Paul that assurance just like he did us. Jeremiah 29, 11, a famous passage taken a little bit out of context when we use it this way because this was a specific time, but I think it applies. It says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Paul believed that he would testify before Caesar, so he believed that despite this storm, despite all of this that's going on, despite all the loss of even the ship, that they were going to survive and they were going to make it. Verse 27, on the 14th night, two weeks of being tossed in a hurricane in total darkness, didn't see sun nor stars for days and days and days, undergirding the ship, throwing everything over, even throwing the food over after they ate to lighten the ship. On the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea when about midnight, the sailors sensed they were approaching land. They took soundings and found that the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found it was 90 feet deep. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape... From the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it fall away. So some of the soldiers said, We're getting decently close to land. This ship is not going to make it. We're going to pretend like we're lowering the anchors or whatever, and we're actually going to lower the lifeboat. We're going to get in the lifeboat. We're getting out of here. Well, they find out what's going on, and Paul says if they do that, there's no, you know, it's not going to work. So they cut the ropes, and I don't know how much they could see at this point. They were praying for daylight, but they could see, I guess, the lifeboat floating away. The last glimpse of hope that a lot of them had, for sure. I can't imagine what it would be like to be tossed at sea for that long. Verse 33, just before dawn, Paul urged them to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you've been in constant suspense and gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now, I urge you to take some food. You'll need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he'd said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of all of them. Remember, he's a prisoner on here. It's not like he's leading the church. He's a prisoner. Then he broke it and began to eat. They all were encouraged and ate some food themselves. All together, another detail, fascinating, there were 276 of us on board. 
Isn't that fascinating, the specificity that Luke gives us here? When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. That was when daylight came. They did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. They hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. So Paul addressed the group again. He got them to eat. Then after they ate, they threw the food over. And I mean... It's crazy. God had promised them a certain outcome, but certainly did not go over the details of the journey. I mean, think about it. When we we have dreams and goals and plans, and sometimes in life they don't work out. Perhaps the tide of life turns in a different different direction. So what do we do when these grand plans that we have fall apart? Well, we have to trust God even with the broken pieces. When your ship goes down, hang on to God. You know, our natural inclination is like those soldiers, is to bail. When things get bad, our natural inclination is to bail. They wanted to get out of here. They were going to use that lifeboat. When things fall apart, sometimes we give up. But it, despite all that these men on this boat had endured, we, we couldn't really blame them if they did. Now look what's happening. They see some land. So they, the rudder, they had the rudder tied so that it wouldn't move because they were just being driven by the wind. They cut that rope loose. And they try, they say, we see this land over here. We don't know where it is. It was the Isle of Malta we find out later. They'd never been there before. They're trying to get to this. So they set the sail up. They cut the ropes. They cut the things to try to make it, to try to crash onto this beach. So that sounds like a decent plan as we can get at this point. All right, so let's see what happened. Verse uh, 41. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. So before they could get to the beach, they hit the sandbar the bow stuck fast and would not move and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding waves so you get the picture they're trying to go in for the land there but before they can get to the beach they get stuck on the sandbar and so the front of the ship is stuck and the waves from this big storm that are coming into the beach are hitting the back of the ship breaking the ship apart So now it's become really desperate. So desperate in verse 42. The soldiers plan to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. So in other words, they were going into self-preservation mode themselves. Like there's no way that we, Paul said we're all going to survive. He didn't say that all the prisoners, none of them would escape. I mean, after all, if they jump in here, this is an island. We don't know where we are. They could get away, so they were going to kill the prisoners. But the centurion wanted to save Paul, and so he didn't allow them to do it. He, verse 43, he wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out our plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. What an amazing story. The ship was being smashed and broken up. And so they knew it was just a matter of time before the waves totally encompassed the ship. So he tells them, everybody who can swim, go ahead and jump overboard now and swim for the shore. Those of you who can't swim, which was probably a lot of them, cling to the broken pieces of the ship. And Luke tells us that every single one of them made it to shore safely, all 276 of them. I mean, when that ship was being smashed, certainly some doubt had to creep in. And then they, you think about, you've been through all this, and now they're going to kill us as prisoners? Because again, if a prisoner escaped, that, that Roman guard would have to take his punishment, his penalty. But some swam in, and others floated in on the broken pieces of the ship. And so the lesson that I get from this is that God will be with us whether our ship comes in, or whether we have to cling to the broken pieces of it. Regardless, he will see us in. He keeps his promises. When your ship goes down, hang on to God. And he will see you in, even on the broken pieces, if need be. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that your ways and your plans are much higher 
than ours, ours. But Lord, certainly we have uh, dreams and hopes and we have plans for this life. But oftentimes, as we live in a fallen world, that, those plans don't come to fruition. But Lord, we know that ultimately your plan to save us and to uh, get us to heaven is, is a promise that we can certainly take. And Lord, your promise to be with us no matter what we face in this life. Lord, there's a lot of people. I mean, our prayer list was full, and we know that there's so many who will watch this or are watching this now and or who are dealing with stuff all over the world. We pray for the families of the soldiers in Afghanistan and for the people who were left behind and for the, the people who are um, in places all over our world that are just like that, where Christianity is forbidden and where um, women and children are, are second-class citizens at best. Lord, we know we live in a fallen world, and there's so much fear even in this free country that we have. But you've promised us that you will be with us. And you've promised us that you will see us in, even if it's on the broken pieces of our plans or dreams or our ships. And I thank you for that promise, Lord. Thank you for this scripture and for giving us this word today. In your name we pray. Amen. Stand with me as let's sing Wherever He Leads, I'll Go, number 285 together this morning. Thank you so much for being here. Don't forget to uh, pray for our youth as they'll be traveling back tomorrow and pray for safety and a lot of fun. They, uh, it's a big, big trip for them, and um, especially after all the sickness that came out the mission trip. The youth are only with our group, and um, we were, it's, it's not funny, but it's funny, but I think Don and I were doing the math the other day, and I think all but like two of the youth have either had COVID or vaccinated, so I think our group's pretty safe <laughs> going on the trip. Uh, that includes the adults too, so we, we made the decision to go ahead with it, and we're thankful for it, and just um, thankful for all that they're doing. Um, hope to see you Wednesday night. If you want to participate in the Wednesday night Bible study, we'd love to have you. Let's pray as we conclude our time together. Dear Father, we just thank you so much for all that you've done. Thank you for being our Father, for seeing us through. We pray for so many people that are going through so many things right now. And God, I just ask that you would um, be with them and get uh, with your presence as only you can. We thank you for it. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.